We are very happy to be with you today. My name is Fieldon Allison. My wife, Janet, and I have lived in Africa since 1972. We've established an institute called Africa Institute of Marriage and Family in order to help African families deal with issues and learn to have healthy marriages. My wife has a master's degree in marriage and family therapy, and I have a master's degree in theology. Janet? What's our question for today? Our question today is one we've been asked many times by participants in our seminars. It is concerning the original sin of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Some people have thought, and many teach, that sex was the original sin. Fildon, what do you think about that? Many people have thought that, and even taught others, that the original sin in the Garden of Eden was sexual sin. Well, let's go to the Bible and see what it has to say about that issue. First, let's look at the very act of that first sin as recorded in Genesis 3, verses 1 through 6. This passage says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from the tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from that tree in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, She took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. The first thing that I notice in this reading of the scriptures is that the first sin seemed to be centered around a tree with fruit. We know that sometimes the Bible can present some things in allegorical form, that is, a picture form that represents something else, in order to teach a lesson. Fildon, do you think this could be an allegory for sex? Well, we can look at another scripture to answer that question. Let me read from Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It says there, Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed, and the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Okay, we can see in these verses that during creation, God planted a garden and put trees in it, including two trees in the middle, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. I think we have to agree that the garden was a real garden with real trees. God even commanded Adam to tend the garden and to take care of it in verse 15. Yes, and they were instructed to eat of the fruit of those trees that were in the garden. Mm -hmm. In verse 16, we see God telling the man, Of every tree in the garden you may freely eat. Then in verse 17, he gives this restriction. He says here, But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. I think that we can all agree that the garden was planted and that the trees God put there provided food for the man and his wife. In fact, it seems that at this point, there was no real cultivation of crops. Only the trees were there to provide food for the two people. All they had to do was to go out and pick the many varieties of fruit off of the trees for their nourishment. However, we have a problem when it comes to understanding those two trees in the middle of the garden, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Were they actual trees? Or can we separate them from the rest of the garden and say that they were allegorical? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil seems to have no more significance in Scripture after this. Mm -hmm. Once it was eaten and their eyes were opened, there was no more need to refrain from eating it. The harm had been done, and God's judgment was delivered to them. From that point on, the bodies of mortal man began to decay and eventually face death. However, we see in chapter 3, verse 24, 
that he drove them out of the garden and placed an angel with a flaming sword to guard the tree of life. Mm -hmm. In verse 22, God says, The man has become like us to know good and evil. And now, lest he take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. For this reason, he cast Adam and Eve out of the garden. It seems that those two special trees that were put into the middle of the garden had special properties. All trees have life-giving qualities to nourish our bodies, even to heal diseases. However, the tree of life seemed to have such power that it could give a person continuous life if a person ate of it. He would never die but live forever. You know, that's a good observation, Janet. You may recall that for centuries, explorers have searched for a fabled fountain of youth. They spent enormous amounts of money and many years, and many of them even lost their lives in the pursuit of this elusive fountain. They believed that if they found this precious water source, they could drink from it and turn back the clock and become young again and regain the vigor and strength of youth and increase the length of their lives, in fact, to live forever. Of course, this fountain of youth was never found. In fact, we no longer have access to the Garden of Eden or to the Tree of Life. Apparently, at some point, that particular tree was transferred to heaven. Isn't that right, Fielden? Exactly. When we read in the Bible in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7, we learn that, To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the Tree of Life, which is in the paradise of God. And again, in chapter 22 and verse 2, we read that, On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. That special tree has obviously been preserved for our use in heaven. It's interesting that the scripture says, for the healing of the nations. That tree continues to have healing, life-giving properties even in heaven. And it gives 12 kinds of fruit that will produce all year round. It's amazing how God provides for our welfare, the healing qualities of the tree, and for our delight, the different varieties of fruit provided. Anyway, we can see that this tree is an actual tree that bears fruit for human consumption. You'd like that tree, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. I think. Now, what about the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Is it also an actual tree with real fruit? or simply an allegory for sex. If we conclude that the tree of life was a real tree with real fruit, we'll have to also conclude that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was also a real tree with real fruit that they could eat. I agree with you. We see Eve actually pick a fruit from the tree and consume it, and then share it with her husband so he could also eat it. And I think we'll have to agree that this fruit also had special powers, just the opposite of the tree of life. It would actually bring death. God told them in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 17 that on the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Before they ate from that tree, their bodies did not decay. And as long as they ate from the tree of life, they would be free from diseases. Mm -hmm. However, When they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, their bodies began to decay, as God told them in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 19, for dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. Yes, that tree brought death as God had warned them, but it also brought some kind of awareness, an opening of the eyes, a knowledge of good and evil. Actually, I think we can agree that they already had a knowledge of good as they communed daily with God in the garden. Mm -hmm. However, that tree had some quality that brought awareness of evil. Now the question becomes, was it a special knowledge of sexual matters? You know, I think that's the root of the question. Even if it was a real tree with real properties, was the knowledge they gained that day about sex? We can again turn to Scripture for the answer. If we look back in the first chapter of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, we have here a blessing from God telling Adam and Eve, Be fruitful and increase in number. 
fill the earth and subdue it. Mm -hmm. In order for Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply, I think we can all agree that sexual intercourse would have to take place. God created the man and the woman with adult hormones and mature bodies that would include having normal sexual attraction to one another. I'm sure that they had already explored each other's bodies and had had sexual intercourse from the very beginning. So Adam and Eve were man and wife, one flesh, as pointed out in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24. And going on in verse 25, we're told, the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Mm -hmm. The thing that changed on the day that they disobeyed God was their awareness of and shame in being naked, as we see in chapter 3, verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Things really changed on that day. They were free and innocent in their walk, even in their sexual activities, until they ate of that fruit. However, I think we can take a lesson from their freedom and lack of shame at being naked. A man and his wife are to be free with one another. There is no shame in being naked when it is just the two of them. Shame only comes when they expose themselves to others. I think we can say that there is no shame and that God is in the midst of them, even when they're naked and enjoying one another. Mm -hmm. God is always present with us. He lives within us, as we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Mm -hmm. Therefore, if God's Spirit is dwelling within our bodies, then when we're having sex, God is present. There is no shame in that. God knows all and sees all. It is he who created man and woman to have sex, and he expects it and he blesses it. That's absolutely right. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4, the writer says, Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure. As long as sexual intercourse is between a husband and his wife, there's no shame, mm -hmm. it is honorable, and there's no evil involved in it then we have to say that the original sin was not intercourse between Adam and Eve. God ordained intercourse and blessed it, and it is to be held in honor. Even though it is not something we want to do in public, it is expected and even required in a marriage. So now we can turn our attention to just what the knowledge of good and evil mm -hmm. actually means. You mentioned that they already had knowledge of good, so eating of the fruit gave them also the knowledge of evil. As you said, that brought shame. They were ashamed to be naked, even in the presence of God. And because of that, God knew immediately that they had eaten of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. It was almost like before they ate, they were like innocent little children. A baby or a small child has no sense of shame at being naked. He plays happily and feels no inhibitions. It's only as he grows and we teach him or her that he or she begins to feel shame at being seen naked. You can even see some tribes of people who have had little or no contact with the civilized world. They can go around with little or no clothing and they're completely free. They feel no shame because they've never been taught that it's shameful for certain parts of the body to be exposed. I sometimes think of the tree of knowledge of good and evil as a temptation that is irresistible because of our desire to know things. For instance, young people often become involved in drugs and alcohol simply because they don't want to be left out. Peer pressure is a powerful pull that entraps many young people. They want to acquire this knowledge of good and evil. Like Adam and Eve, they've known good. However, they want to be like their friends and come to know the evil things that their friends are involved in. Even in sexual affairs, young people have a lot of pressure put on them these days to get involved sexually. Even adults tell them, just protect yourself mm -hmm. so you don't get pregnant or contract any disease. The message the youth are hearing is, we know you can't resist, so just use contraceptive devices to protect yourself. Yes, we're sending our kids the wrong message. 
If they rely on Jesus and stay close to him, following God's ways, they can not only prevent pregnancy, but also keep their bodies free from diseases. And they'll be pleasing to God, which is the most important thing. That's right. God honors sex in marriage, but he expects young people to wait until marriage and married people to be faithful to their partners. I wonder if that's why so many people get the idea that the tree of knowledge of good and evil was sexual sin. It is such a prevalent sin these days in our society, among young people as well as married couples. It's a strong pull, a tool of Satan, to cause people to fall. However, there are many ways that we can fall into sin. Yeah. In fact, we can see from Eve's own words that what pulled her into temptation was actually pride and a desire to be like God himself. Mm -hmm. I think we could even say that this pride is what leads us into so many sins. Young people are too proud and don't want to be rejected or put down by their peers. They don't stand up for what they know is right because they don't want to appear weak, fearful, or different. Actually, though, standing up for what is right against the pressures Mm -hmm. of society and one's peers is actually a sign of great strength. Mm -hmm. The weak one is the one who gives in quickly. He is the one who is fearful, afraid of rejection. To stand alone takes a great deal of courage. You are so right. It takes real strength to be able to stand up to the pressure and do the right thing when all around others are giving in. And actually, those who give in have a great deal of respect for the one who resists. They just don't want to let them know that they feel this way because then they would be admitting their own weakness and shame. Instead, they make fun of and persecute the one who stands against the crowd. That's a good point. Whatever appearance this fruit had on that tree of knowledge, it signifies Adam and Eve's disobedience to God's directions. Mm -hmm. He had told them not to eat of that specific tree, and they went ahead and ate of it. I think it's interesting that Eve told Satan that they were allowed to eat of all the other trees in the garden, but forbidden to eat of that one tree. They had many options, many varieties of good things, but she was not satisfied until she tasted of that forbidden fruit. Had to have that forbidden fruit. We are much like that. If something is denied to us, then we want that particular thing more than anything else. You know, the lesson that we can learn from this story is that whenever we do something that God has forbidden, Mm -hmm. then we'll be punished, Mm -hmm. just as surely as Adam and Eve were punished. We must be careful to always do what pleases God and not be pulled by what is forbidden. God has given us so many good things, things that bring us pleasure, good food, good fellowship, music, art education, games, jobs. There are so many good things that we can get involved in. Let us be content with those things and not go for the forbidden fruit. If you have any questions about these matters or anything else pertaining to marriage, email us at aimfradio at gmail.com. May God bless all of you with the wisdom and the courage to resist temptations. We thank you for watching this episode.